any difficulty understanding what I'm talking about or wants me to talk a little bit slower or can't understand my accent because it's maybe a little bit strange then uh, just shout up and I will try to uh, speak a little bit more clearly or to speak a little bit more slowly so that you can understand what I'm talking about. Um, the, the title of this session is The Golden Days of Computer Game Music. So um, I uh, thought I would uh, maybe go right back to uh, how, it, how things all started for me uh, back in the days of uh, over just about 20 years ago or something like that. Um, I can go through uh, a little bit about you know, how I got started and what used to happen in the early days. Um, First of all, um, my background was always as a as a musician, and uh, you, you know, back in uh, 1980, I uh, had a house, um, and I had various keyboards and synths, and uh, you know, drum machines and things like that, and. Uh, I was all, I was working as a musician in those days, and I was also very interested uh, in electronics as well. And I used to buy a lot of the electronics magazines and build those those little um, kits and little projects that they had in those magazines. And uh, round about that time, uh, they were talking a lot about computers and programming and how that was really going to affect what was going to be happening in the uh, the music business and they had uh, little articles in the magazines about programming and most of it was basic or fourth or something like that and uh, I used to read those things and they had <coughs> in basic they had things like uh, you know let A equals A plus B and you know that was something that was just completely foreign to somebody who'd been, you know, never known anything about BASIC. And so uh, I, I was uh, very interested in uh, BASIC and computers at that time. And um, because I just couldn't figure out what on earth A equals A plus B meant, you know, it was just bizarre to me. What the hell are these people talking about, you know? So um, I, uh, was looking around at computers in uh, 1982 or whatever it was, and there were various things like uh, the Memo Tech, and then there was the early uh, uh, Sinclair kit machines, which was the uh, touch panel type machine, which you could buy as a kit. And then uh, the uh, Vic 20 was out. Then there was a new machine called the C64, was just came out. And that had a much better sound chip, and seemed I was interested in uh, music, and this thing was advertised on the TV, and the 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 advert that they used to have at that time featured an elephant, because uh, you know the C64 had 64k of memory, and so you know they they used to the adverts at the time used to say this has got C64, uh, it's got 64k of memory. It's like an elephant. Nobody will ever fill this memory because it's got so much, you know. And uh, so I thought, well, that's good enough for me, you know. So I bought a C64 and then um, I uh, switched it on and nothing happened. And then I uh, typed in a program from the, the early book that you used to get with the C64. I had so many mistakes in it. It was just... <laughs> You know, if anybody ever got one of those original books, it, it was just so frustrating because you would you would type in something from that book and nothing would ever work. Um, but uh, basically, you know, it did enough to uh, spark my interest, and uh, I was determined that this stupid little box like this was not going to make me look like a complete idiot after I would type something in and nothing would happen. That was just it was one of those challenges where, you know, I was uh, determined not to uh, be beaten down by a stupid little box. I couldn't do anything. So I persevered with this thing and uh, I got into, eventually got, you know, 
learn basic and learn a lot about the graphic side of what was going on with this box. And then um, I uh, was reading about assembly language and how much better and how much faster that was. And so I thought, well, I'm going to have to dabble with assembly language. So um, first thing I did in assembly language on a C64 was move a sprite across the screen like that. And uh, if, if you ever did that in basic, you, you know, on the C64, it would move like that. You do it in assembly language and it would, you couldn't even see it move across the screen. The only problem was uh, in, the, in that time, I didn't have an assembler, so I had to basically uh, poke the numbers in memory and then just do a syscall and see what happened. Most of the time, of course, it crashed. So, But anyway, um, that got my uh, interest going and I got heavily into learning hexadecimal 6502 and uh, the next thing that I had to try to learn uh, was this business of uh, interrupts. Uh, that was just completely a weird concept. Um, no, but none of the books, no, no, you know, no, none of the people I talked to really explained how it all worked. But um, like everything else, eventually, you know, you um, something clicks and it falls into place, and uh, you understand what interrupts are. And um, and then uh, I started coding, you know, a music player. Um, and some of the graphic type effects. I wrote graphic editors and things like that as well because that all helped to learn <coughs> assembly language. So, um, learning hex and uh, hexadecimal 6502 interrupts was all really uh, the thing that kind of stimulated uh, my um, imagination. And, uh, you know, like all of, like everybody here, I was a complete and utter fanatic about this stuff. I mean, you know, I would basically keep working until, you know, five o'clock in the morning. And then, of course, we had tape machines in those days. So I'd work till five o'clock in the morning and then think, oh, God, I have to save this stuff. I got a, at least another hour and a half because I got to do two saves on cassette, which would take like 45 minutes of source code. You had to do two saves, otherwise you just couldn't risk just saving once, you know. And then um, I would you'd get up in the next morning and the uh, first thing you would do before you did anything was start the, the uh, load from tape because that would take another 45 minutes to load up, assuming that there wasn't an error, you know. So you would uh, start the load and then have breakfast. Um, so uh, what happened after that was um, I uh, kind of dabbled doing some educational software because I thought that was a really good idea. So I did a you know a, three, a suite of three programs and uh, took them to the schools and they thought they were really good, but they said that well we don't have enough money to spend on any of this stuff. We just have to buy books, and so um, I thought well. What else am I going to do, you know? So um, I started looking at the games, and uh, the uh, early s the games that were around in like 1982 and 83, um, most of the music was done by the programmer. The programmer did everything in those days, and uh, some of the music was just absolutely diabolical. I mean, it was just it was embarrassing, you know. It was like a drunken monkey, you know, on the piano trying to play the Blue Danube or something, you know. And I thought, there has to be, you know, an opening for somebody who can at least get the notes right and, you know, in the correct order, for God's sake, you know. And um, the, uh, what, what I did after that was I, um, I started working with a games company to produce a game and uh, the company uh, was doing this. There was a, there's a breakfast cereal called Weetabix. I don't know if anybody's ever, ever heard of Weetabix. And so they had this little character that looked like a, uh, the, the, like a Weetabix cereal with legs, you know. And so, they were, you know, we were going to do this 